Welcome to this video where we're going to be looking at the signs and symptoms of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as well as the investigations that will help you in the diagnosis and the long-term management. If you haven't already done so, be sure to check out our other video where we discuss the pathophysiology of COPD. Firstly, let's look at the signs and symptoms typically found in patients with COPD. A patient's signs and symptoms will depend on what the primary underlying disease process is, whether that be chronic bronchitis or emphysema. Let's start with our chronic bronchitis patients and signs and symptoms that will be particularly prevalent to them. Patients suffering with chronic bronchitis are said to be blue bloaters, as they are commonly seen to have a high BMI and are cyanosed from the low blood oxygen levels. Patients with chronic bronchitis tend to suffer more with hypoxemia as opposed to hypercapnia. Some specific signs and symptoms include a chronic productive cough due to hypersecretion of mucus that irritates the airways, an expiratory wheeze which will be polymorphic and heard on auscultation, this is due to air travelling at high speeds through narrow airways, similar to a whistle in action. Crackles on inspiration, as air travelling at high velocity causes the airways to open rapidly. And cyanosis, which is a blue discoloration which can be seen centrally, such as the lips or tongue, or peripherally, such as the fingers. And this is caused by a lack of oxygen bound to red blood cells. Now let's look at our emphysemic patients and what signs and symptoms are more prominent for them. Patients suffering with emphysema are said to be pink puffers as they are commonly seen to be breathing through pursed lips in an attempt to prolong exhalation to eliminate more air whilst preventing the airways from collapsing. The high levels of CO2 in the blood cause vasodilation giving them a flushed or pink complexion. Patients with emphysema tend to suffer more with hypercapnia as opposed to hypoxemia. Specific signs and symptoms may include what we call malar flush, which is the pink complexion due to vasodilation caused by hypercapnia, pursed lip breathing to increase airway pressure that prevents the airways from collapsing on exhalation, muscle wasting due to increased energy expenditure as they work harder to try and ventilate their lungs, a slim complexion, again due to the high energy expenditure and weight loss, and inspiratory crackles as collapsed alveoli rapidly open with increased air pressure. Other clinical manifestations which can be seen in COPD, which are not specific to either disease process, include an increased respiratory rate, otherwise known as tachypnea, which is a result of impaired ventilation caused by hypersecretion of mucus and structural changes to the alveoli and small airways. Contrary to popular belief, it is carbon dioxide levels which have a greater effect on respiratory drive than oxygen levels. As gaseous exchange within the alveoli is impaired, it can cause hypercapnia or high carbon dioxide levels within the blood. This triggers chemoreceptors in the brainstem and the respiratory centre, increasing respiratory drive. The chemoreceptors that sense the change in carbon dioxide levels not only trigger the respiratory centre, but they also trigger the cardiac accelerator centre, leading to an increase in heart rate. These patients will typically have low blood oxygen levels and high carbon dioxide levels, due to impaired gaseous exchange in the pulmonary system, known as hypoxemia and hypercapnia. Patients may present with an increased work rate of breathing or shortness of breath as they have reduced pulmonary function associated with hypoxia and hypercapnia. This may be particularly worse when the patient exerts themselves and they increase their production of CO2 and increase their demand for oxygen. Patients may suffer with recurrent chest infections due to impaired pulmonary defences and the trapping of pathogens within the mucus and alveoli. They may present with an extended expiratory phase when exhaling 
due to the difficulty these patients have in overcoming the partially obstructed airways. Polycythemia, also known as erythrocytosis, and this is the creation of red blood cells in response to chronic hypoxemia. Having a high concentration of red blood cells in circulation makes the blood more viscous and may lead to further health complications such as thrombi formation. Patients may develop pulmonary hypertension and this is caused when poorly oxygenated areas of lung tissue constrict their blood vessels in an attempt to restore the ventilation to perfusion ratio. Areas of lung that have high levels of oxygen will receive greater perfusion, so more oxygen and carbon dioxide can be exchanged. When a patient has COPD, this can cause widespread constriction of the pulmonary vessels, thus increasing the blood pressure within the pulmonary system. This is known as pulmonary hypertension, as it is isolated to the lungs, but it can cause other complications and other signs and symptoms that we see in COPD patients. The most serious is a condition called core pulmonale, and this is enlargement and failure of the right side of the heart as a response to increased vascular resistance in the pulmonary system. These patients may also have an increased anterior-posterior diameter, also known as a barrel chest, as air becomes trapped in the alveoli, hyperinflating the thoracic cavity. These patients' lungs may be hyper-resonance on percussion due to this air becoming trapped within the lung tissue. Now let's look at how COPD can be diagnosed. Diagnosis is made on clinical presentation and pulmonary function tests. A patient will typically present with symptoms suggestive of the diagnosis. For chronic bronchitis to be diagnosed, the patient must have had a chronic productive cough for three consecutive months for at least two consecutive years. A pulmonary function test is used to diagnose COPD and consists of two measurements. The first is the volume of air a patient can exhale as fast as possible in one second and is a measurement of how easily air can flow out of the lungs. It is denoted as FEV1 and stands for forced expiratory volume in one second. The second is the forced vital capacity and it is a measurement of the total amount of air a patient can take into their lungs. It's denoted as FVC. An obstructive lung disease is diagnosed when the forced expiratory volume in one second is less than 75% of the forced vital capacity. This demonstrates that a patient has a condition which affects the passage of air during exhalation. We then need to test whether the obstruction is reversible or chronic. This is done by giving the patient a short-acting bronchodilator and repeating the test. If the forced expiratory volume over one second improves by 12% or more, then the diagnosis is asthma. If it does not improve or it is less than 12%, it's chronic and would be categorised as a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. To aid in the diagnosis and management even further, investigations can be conducted, but not all the tests will be required. Some additional investigations include a chest x-ray, which can be used to identify air trapping and subsequent hyperinflation with an increased anteroposterior diameter. It can also help identify a flattened diaphragm or bullet. A chest x-ray can also be used to exclude other pathologies, such as cancer. A full blood count can be taken. Haemoglobin levels can check for polycythemia. We can check for potassium levels, which can be lowered with the use of short-acting bronchodilators. C-reactive protein for an infective cause of the patient's symptoms. A pro-BMP, which can be raised in heart failure or when the heart becomes strained due to pulmonary hypertension and we can also check albumin, B12, iron and folate 
to rule out anemia and help to monitor nutritional status. An arterial blood gas may reveal low oxygen levels, raised carbon dioxide levels, and the pH levels may drop in cases of respiratory acidosis. Sputum cytology can be utilised to test for chronic infections such as tuberculosis or pseudomonas. And we can also perform an ECG, and this can be used to assess for any cardiac manifestations such as core pulmonale or any arrhythmias. Now that we've discussed the signs and symptoms and diagnosis of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, let's look at the management. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is irreversible, so treatment is based on delaying the progression of the disease and managing patient symptoms to improve quality of life. The most effective treatment is smoking cessation, as this is the leading cause in 95% of COPD cases, and in patients who may have another cause of their COPD, smoking will only accelerate the process. So the best management is to help the patient to stop smoking Treatment will be guided based on the severity and frequency of symptoms that a patient experiences. Treatments will vary, so it's important to make yourself familiar with local guidelines. For mild, infrequent symptoms, dual therapy is often utilised with a short-acting beta-2 agonist and an anti-muscarinic agent. Short-acting beta-2 agonists work by stimulating beta-2 receptors within bronchial smooth muscle. This causes an intracellular rise in cyclic AMP, which leads to relaxation and dilatation of the bronchioles. Antimuscarinics, or anticholinergics, work by binding to muscarinic 3 receptors within the bronchial smooth muscle, blocking the effect of acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nervous system. Acetylcholine causes a rise in intracellular calcium causing contraction of bronchial smooth muscle, resulting in bronchoconstriction. Inhibiting the effects of acetylcholine will naturally lead to bronchodilation. There is also some evidence to suggest that inhibiting parasympathetic effects within the pulmonary system leads to a reduction in mucus production and secretion, therefore improving a patient's symptoms. These medications work best when given as dual therapy. It is important patients are shown how to use their inhalers effectively. For patients who experience more frequent symptoms or notice that their symptoms are getting worse, we can then progress on to a long-acting beta-2 agonist and a long-acting antimuscarinic. The mechanism of action is the same as the short-acting agents, but they exert their effects for much longer, providing a longer period of relief. If additional treatment needs to be given to help relieve frequent symptoms and the long-acting beta-2 agonist and the long-acting anti-muscarinic are not enough, then a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid can also be considered. But this must be weighed up against the potential side effects that steroids have. Steroids work by suppressing cytokine release and white blood cell recruitment, which ultimately suppresses the inflammatory response. Oral corticosteroids are not routinely given and are reserved for acute exacerbations or during times of infection due to the adverse effects that long-term steroid use has on the body. Long-term oxygen therapy is not usually required but may need to be considered in patients who have chronic hypoxemia, polycythemia or heart failure. Other treatments for more severe cases include phosphodiesterase inhibitors, which promote smooth muscle relaxation in bronchial smooth muscle, mucolytics, which help break down secretions, and prophylactic antibiotics, such as azithromycin. Patients who suffer frequent exacerbations can also be provided with antibiotics and oral corticosteroids, known as rescue medication, that they can take when they feel an infection has started. This is particularly useful in preventing the infection causing an acute exacerbation, but this relies heavily on the patient's ability in recognising the symptoms and not abusing the treatment. Patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease will need regular reviews to monitor the progression of the disease. 
The patients will also need assessing for complications such as cardiovascular disorder, metabolic disease, bone disease, lung cancer, muscle weakness, haematological disorders, depression and functional decline. To recap, COPD is a chronic inflammatory respiratory condition that causes irreversible damage to the airways and lung tissue, mainly due to smoking. COPD is diagnosed based on clinical presentation and pulmonary function tests. Signs and symptoms include a persistent cough for at least three months of the year for two consecutive years, difficulty in breathing, reduced pulmonary function, and recurrent chest infections. Treatment for long-term management includes bronchodilators and steroids, which should be used in a stepwise approach to meet the specific needs of the patient. It is also important to adopt an holistic approach to care and regularly review patients to monitor for changes in their condition. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other video on COPD exacerbations and management. And if there are any topics you would like us to cover, then please leave a comment in the comment section below.